Hi, this is Patrick Von Rau, orthopedic surgeon from the Brisbane Hip Clinic, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Physiocram and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the latest and greatest physical performance information to help you pursue and perform at your own physical best. We do this across a range of episodes, including interest editions, expert editions, coaches' corners, and featured performer episodes. And on today's episode, I share a conversation with you that I recently had with leading orthopedic hip surgeon, Dr. Patrick Weinrau, as we, on this expert edition, take a deep dive into the world of common hip joint presentations and the role that surgery may or may not have in managing these conditions. Now, an excellent Complement to today's expert edition is the archived edition featuring UK-based sports physiotherapist Benoit Matthews, episode 129. So if you missed that prior expert edition, be sure to jump back and combine with today's featured guest, Associate Professor Dr. Patrick Weinrau, you'll be completely across all things hip-related pain and conditions. By way of bio, Associate Professor Patrick Weinrau is an orthopedic surgeon who exclusively manages hip joint disorders in adults. A significant proportion of Dr. Weinrau's private practice is dedicated to the management of active people with hip disorders who wish to maintain high activity levels and function in both sporting and lifestyle recreational pursuits. Associate Professor Weinrack is a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and a fellow of the Australian Orthopaedic Association. Dr. Weinrau is currently appointed as Deputy Editor for the International Journal of Advanced Joint Reconstruction, a member of the Australian Arthroplasty Society, Australian Medical Association and the Australian Society of Orthopaedic Surgeons. Dr. Weinrau is widely and actively involved in medical education, conducting regular demonstrations and lectures on advanced techniques in in hip joint surgery to train colleagues Australian and overseas based. Dr. Von Rau maintains interest in clinical research and orthopedic engineering with multiple publications and a Master of Engineering thesis relating to revision of hip joint replacements. He was prior awarded a Doctorate of Philosophy for his research relating to the surgical management of adult hip joint disorders. And he's the founding doctor of the Brisbane Hip Clinic Australia. Now, what makes Dr. Weinrack such a great fit for the physical performance show is his astute interest in pursuing one's physical best. Dr. Weinrack has been a competitive cyclist himself, and on the eve of this recording, he sat preparing from his Brisbane home to leave Australia for Switzerland to tackle the mighty Matterhorn. In addition, Dr. Weinrack last year attempted Everestin on a set of stairs in Brisbane, So this is a surgeon who absolutely gets the need and the drive to be at one's physical best. And on today's episode, we cover all things hip joint pain and conditions. So if you yourself have ever suffered from hip pain or someone in your world, get ready with a pen and paper for this expert edition featuring Associate Professor Dr. Patrick Weinrack. All truth be told, this is a re-recording of an initial snippet that we uh, had a bit of difficulty with uh, and just lost. So uh, thank you for your, firstly, your, uh, your generosity of time for, amongst your busy schedule and secondly, your willingness to uh, capture the first bit of data which was uh, actually lost. My pleasure, my pleasure. Patrick, you are one busy gentleman. You're on the eve of, uh, of heading off for one of your great passions, mountaineering overseas. But 
Aside from your professional work, Brisbane Hip Clinic, specialization in hip surgery, uh, sorry, in hip, uh, in orthopedic hip surgery and the active sporting hip, you also are a family man and, uh, and you have these quite interesting recreational pursuits. So can you paint a v- brief picture of the man behind the professional front? Uh, so I'm in my mid forties, um, and uh, for a lot of years I um, I've been doing um, different sporting pursuits at uh, varying levels. Uh, uh, like most orthopedic surgeons, we're pretty much type A personalities and uh, sort of strive to excel in whatever we do, whether it's in our working life or um, or uh, sporting careers and. Um, so uh, I've gone through a couple of different crazy adventures through my life. Um, rode pretty hard for a for a lot of years, and um, uh, rode across the Atlantic, and um, uh, started taking up took up cycling after that, and and I went from road cycling to track cycling, and um, uh, and uh, hung up the boots from track cycling uh, about two years ago after achieving um, a few goals that I was looking for in that, and then um, and since then I've been um, I've had a bit of a vacuum, and I've and the vacuum's been filled by uh, by mountaineering, and uh, I've been trying to combine my uh, my vocation as a doctor with my mountaineering, and. Um, uh, both in terms of uh, personal satisfaction and safety, um, not really from a from a an employment point of view. I can't even see myself uh, rescuing people on tops of mountains unless I was there or myself trying to climb it. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so and mountaineering is just an amazing sport. It's uh, you know it's it, it's it's the great outdoors on steroids. It's uh, you know it's there's it, field craft. There's there's uh, there's rope work. There's there's uh, amazing scenery. There's great people to meet. Um, lots and lots of things to learn. And um, yeah, no. So uh, yeah, so I'm just about to head off to Switzerland and do it again. And perhaps take on the Matterhorn. And uh, you also took on an urban Everest. Uh, last year in Brisbane on a set of steps, and uh, that was, a, I believe, a 14-hour journey. So Everesting is something that uh, cyclists do a bit. Uh, so the, the whole idea about Everesting something is that you you ascend the vertical height of Mount Everest uh, in a single sitting. So it's 8,848 metres of climbing, and so it doesn't really matter what you're doing. That's a fair bit of climbing. Um, and uh, so... Um, on stairs, um, actually, it's interesting. Once you actually start doing high volume stairs, you do realise that there, there are some um, uh, there are some tricks to it which you wouldn't have thought of until you start doing it. It's a little bit like, um, and the main one's fluid management, and uh, that's actually what got me in the end. I actually failed in my attempt, but I got pretty damn close. Uh, but the fluid management is a, a really uh, interesting conundrum with stair climbing because you're um, uh, you're not able to shed enough heat quickly enough, so you lose heaps of volumes of fluid. And uh, it's not like running because you at least you've got that con- to get that convection going past you um, because the speed at which you're ascending is, is relatively slower. So it's a little bit like getting on a wind trainer with no fans indoors. And uh, so, yeah, so I got to about 7,100, I think, was where I got. And uh, it took me about 14 hours. But uh, in the end, the, uh, the dehydration and the fluid management plan let me down but uh i gave it a good hard crack and uh and uh, i certainly suffered and that was that was the point of the whole exercise was to suffer and uh certainly i think that gives you a great grounding for a lot of the population that you do see which is uh you know those wishing to maintain high levels of function in, in sport and in lifestyle with their recreational pursuits yeah so my my practice is um uh, a little unusual for uh, a lot of orthopedic surgeons dealing with hips in that uh, I've sort of got a, a fairly strong blend of young patients coming to see me. Um, and uh, so the, the, typically they've got um, less wear in their hip joints. They're on the lower end of the degenerative joint disease spectrum. And um, a lot of those people are the ones in whom have got, you know, like uh, cartilage tears, uh, pre-arthritic and uh, they uh, they have a lot of um, unique um, requirements because a lot of them are very very highly active um, 
professional sports people or um, or amateur, very uh, serious athletes, and um, so and then so working their their surgical timeframes in with their window of opportunity between events, uh, depending on their sport, is um, is actually quite challenging sometimes because uh, the the rehabilitation um, does need to be taken. Uh, pretty seriously if you're going to attain a, a high level quality result you know, two two key phrases there Patrick the the surgery time frame and the window of opportunity which denotes that you know if people are going to have an intervention such as a, a hip procedure done by someone like yourself then there is uh, a window of opportunity where it s- s- sounds like they can get the best outcomes yeah, so for for my surgery, we're not really dealing with life-threatening conditions. It's not like you've been diagnosed with cancer. So, you know, you are very rarely going to come into a situation where you're being um, uh, advised that you need to have urgent surgery for um, for the reasons of trying to uh, avert a catastrophic outcome. Uh, so a lot of the time... Patients can be managed very well by uh, activity modifications and uh, and other non-surgical measures. Um, as even if it's uh, uh, not a definitive way, um, as an interim measure to be able to buy them some time to a, a point where it's a little bit more convenient for them to have their intervention done. So an example of that might be uh, for your younger, more athletic population, uh, it might be a, a footballer who's um, in season at the time, is functioning okay, um, probably needing to reduce his uh, or her um, uh, exercise volume and maybe adjust their training schemes, but is still able to participate in match play quite safely, but um, is having some symptoms that are impacting upon their function. Um, And those ones, so long as they're not broken athletes uh, and they're still able to participate, in many cases can be held off until the off-season. And so off-season surgeries are an example of a window of opportunity where um, so long as they've not got an injury that is going to deteriorate significantly in the interim period can often wait. Yeah, so timing really matters. And in terms of Patrick you know, what we'd know as epidemiology uh, prevalence or incidence with hip conditions, uh, you know, you have stated that it depends on how it's defined, those that are symptomatic or clinically, you know, they're experiencing reduced functional quality of life as opposed to those that would have some changes on uh, on imaging x-rays, for example. So uh, can you paint a bit of a picture in terms of, you know, in the population, how many people are experiencing you know quality of life deficits because of hip conditions yeah so that's a really important differentiation um so if you were to look at the incidence of osteoarthritic degeneration in our community it depends on how you define it so if we were to define osteoarthritis radiographically that is upon the appearance of an x-ray or looking at a uh, a person's ct scan or mri scan the incidence of osteoarthritic change within a hip joint is um, is in fact quite common. So if we look at pe- people who are age over 60, for instance, um, we would see radiographic changes of reasonably significant osteoarthritic wear and even up to a, a quarter of those people. But only a fraction of those people would be having symptomatic deficits or um, functionally important uh, deterioration in their quality of life as a result of of that arthritic degeneration. So the, the, there are a lot of people who would come to me who have uh, reasonably significant um, degenerative joint disease on scans uh, or, or indeed things like labral tears on scans or things that have been picked up radiologically um, in whom are not necessarily experiencing many symptoms. Um, and so an example of that would be um, labral tears, which are, in fact, on MRI scan are incredibly common. Um, so uh, even to the point where um, if you're talking, depending again on what you define as a tear, um, some form of degenerative change within the uh, acetabular a labrum, which is a, a cartilage that supports the hip joint, um, can be seen in, uh, you know, maybe 60 or 70 or maybe even 80% of people on, a, on an MRI scan. But 
vast majority of those will not have any symptoms. So, um, so when a surgeon makes an assessment of your hip, um, what really defines our recommendations are going to be your description of your symptoms and how it's impacting upon your quality of life. And we'll use the radiology reports uh, and the imaging as a guidance as to what treatments are likely to be effective for that person and to be able to guide the person as to uh, a, an assessment of which treatments are going to result in, 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 in what degree of improvement and um, and symptom resolution. But essentially, the, the decision as to whether we institute any treatment, whether that be non-operative treatment or whether it be operative treatment, and how far we push those treatments is really um, borne very heavily upon the um, the degree of symptoms and, and impact upon the quality of life. Yeah, so the imaging results uh, are part of the, the clinical decision-making um, framework, if you like, from someone like yourself Patrick, but they are not the uh, the key determinant in terms of uh, any intervention that you may or may not do. Yeah, so a good example of that would be um, I would frequently see people who would come to me with a, a severely arthritic hip uh, that might need to have a joint replacement performed, for instance, but the other hip is equally worn or sometimes even more. Um, yet they're, they're, they may be getting no symptoms from that particular joint. And so the recommendation for the non-symptomatic arthritic joint is indeed continued observation in the vast majority of cases. Yeah, interesting. And uh, there are, is a high prevalence. I often counsel people from the physiotherapy room that cha all changes on imaging aren't necessarily uh, anything to be concerned about. That one liner, you know, it just tells us that you've got a pulse in many instances. But the, the big differentiator, as you mentioned, is if their quality of life is being impacted. Yeah, so um, it, it's a very common discussion that I'd have with people where they come to me and they, um, they've got a, a, a radiology um, a report, uh, particularly MRI scan, because MRI scan is uh, so sensitive, it picks up so many different pathologies. And the art with, those, with interpreting those sorts of images is trying to correlate them to the nature of the symptoms that the person's been presenting with. Um, and um, so, um, so the, the person who has a, a radiology report that report that that states that they've got, for instance, femoris tabular impingement or a small labral tear, um, does need to be taken into context. Yeah, noted, Patrick. One hundred and one. Sorry, anatomy one hundred and one. Can you describe yep. the hip joint? Uh, yeah. So, um, so the hip joint is a ball and socket joint. Um, it, uh, it's, it's able to move in multiple different rotational ways. So it can move internally, externally, sideways, front and back. Um, unlike a hinge joint where it's really a hinge can only really load in one direction, the, the hip joint, because it's a ball and socket, can move in multiple different directions. The difference with the hip joint, though, is a very deep hip. Uh, it's a very deep ball and socket, um, and so it doesn't translate much. Um, unlike, for instance, the shoulder, where, which is a, a very sh a sh very shallow ball and socket joint, um, the shoulder is able to translate, and if it translates too far, then it will dislocate. So we don't see dislocations of the hip joint anywhere near as commonly as what we might do with dislocations of the shoulder. There is some form of translation, though, but usually only at the very end ranges of motion. And so one of the downsides about being a, a, a deep uh, ball and socket is that once the ball moves to a certain point, at the terminal ranges of motion, uh, you get a, a phenomenon called femoroacetabular impingement, where the ball of the socket hits against the edge of the socket and then can lever the hip joint a little bit. And that's where you start getting some form of translational motion, um, which indeed is a, a, a potential cause for accelerated damage within the hip joint. And that translational motion is analogous to shear forces? Yeah, so that the the hip joint cartilage 
So think of like the end of a chicken bone where you've got that really smooth, translucent, low-friction cartilage. That's the gliding cartilage, what we call highline cartilage. And um, that's the bearing surface of the joint. And it goes, it lines the inside of the socket and it's on the outside of the ball of the hip joint. Um, That cartilage is extremely durable. So it's only very thin on each of the joint surfaces on the ball and the socket. It's only two to three millimetres thick, yet it can last you your whole life. So it's a, it, and it's very, very durable in compression. So you can load it very heavily. For instance, when you run um, and you're impacting it and you're placing like seven times your, your effective body weight through that cartilage, or if you're or if you're you know, carrying a heavy backpack up hills and things like that, um, that cartilage is very, very durable in compression. But it's very sensitive to shear forces. So it's, it doesn't at all like being loaded um, in certain directions. And so when a hip joint undergoes the phenomenon of impingement, that's a potential risk factor for this very durable cartilage to be split quite easily and sheared off the bone. And that can be a cause for um, quite early significant degenerative joint disease um, within even quite young people, particularly uh, depending if they've got a shape irregularity within their hip joint that predisposes them. And also if they're performing certain particular sports that might predispose them a little bit more. For instance, cross midline and kicking in, in AFL footballers with their dominant leg predominantly have a, a slightly higher risk of degenerative joint disease on that side. And so we've got the ball and socket, the cartilage, uh, a structure that many people may have heard of is the labrum or the acetabular labrum. Can you can you speak to that? Yeah, so the, the acetabular labrum is a cartilage that runs around the outside of the rim of the socket. It, it doesn't really bear much load. Um, its um, effect is more like a vacuum seal. Uh, so it's not like a fridge seal. And so what it does is it sort of grips, the, it, it runs in the outside of the socket, it sort of grips the ball of the hip joint. And it helps to be able to uh, entrain all of the lubricating fluid throughout the hip joint in an even manner. Um, And um, so um, labral tears um, uh, on MRI scan are really common. The interesting thing about labral tears on MRI is um, uh, in what we see clinically at at arthroscopic surgery is that um, tear is probably not the right word. Um, because when you think of the word tear, you sort of think about two parts being broken apart or ripped where um, they've been completely dissociated. And we actually very rarely see that in the hip joint. Um, the better description that I like to use is more um, fraying, right? Because it's, it's, it's um, whilst there can be acute accidents or injuries that can propagate a tear, the better way of thinking of it is it's a microscopic accumulation of small amounts of damage over a very, very long period of time. Um, and uh, so the best analogy I give people is it's a little bit like a rope. Um, and that rope has got thousands and thousands of fibres together, right, or hundreds of fibres together, and over time the core of that rope becomes soft, right, and so you can see little cracks that are forming inside it on an MRI scan, but if you actually, and and we call that a tear, but in reality when you look at it in in the flesh when you're at the time of surgery, um, what you more see is more like fraying of the cartilage um, rather than actually one discrete broken piece of two good good pieces of cartilage it's more like an accumulation of small amounts of fraying over a long period of time so yeah degenerative fraying is probably a better word although there are people who have acute propagations of them there's usually an underlying degenerative change within the labrum itself and certainly uh i don't think anyone's excited to to read or be told they have a tear anywhere in their body so it's certainly a yeah. less what we call no cebic term fraying than uh, than tear so that's a great distinction and patrick uh one of the other key pieces of the hip anatomy that i've heard you reference before is uh is the, a key ligament the ligament and teres so it's got a funny name, but can you uh, paint a little bit of a picture around its role? Yeah, so the ligamentum teres is the uh, is the ligament that runs. It's the only ligament inside the hip joint. It, it runs between the ball and the socket. Um, the size of it is about half of your little finger, 
um, in thickness. Um, it's a really important ligament in children and babies because it carries a, a, an important blood supply uh, that helps to nourish the bone of the ball of the hip joint. In adults, there's a, a difference in the blood supply that develops um, uh, when the uh, when the growth plate of the hip fuses. And so it's less of a, 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 a concern in terms of nutrition of the hip joint to have a ligamentum teres tear in, a, in an adult. But it still has an important role, we feel, um, in uh, what we call proprioception, which is the body's ability to be able to uh, uh, sense joint position um, in motion. And it's a very, very richly innovated. It's got many, many small fibres, nerve fibres within it. Um, so ligamentum teres is an interesting one because um, uh, there are certain population groups that are far more predisposed to having ligamentum teres tears. Um, and so to understand this, you have to understand a little bit about the anatomy and function of ligamentum teres. So the ligamentum teres only ever gets on stretch when you're in terminal ranges of rotation of the hip joint. Um, and so you've really got to twist the hip a really long way to be able to get that ligamentum teres under stretch. So if you've got someone who's a, a little bit inflexible, so say, for instance, like myself, um, maybe larger muscular male, um, stronger supporting capsule ligaments around the hip joint that prevents that hip from rotating too far, I can't ever get my ligamentum teres under stretch in the first place. So I'm not really going to tear it. Um, the, the, the difference would be if someone's really, really flexible. Um, so, for instance, if they've got hyperligamentous laxity or some form of syndrome, um, or alternatively, if they're younger, more supple female who's uh, participating in, a, uh, um, in uh, activities that involve terminal ranges of motion on a regular basis, and they're really striving to get all they can with the rotation. So, for instance, ballet um, or gym. Um, they would be at higher risk of getting ligament and teres tears. So we would really commonly see it's the younger female population, the more flexible people in whom get ligament and teres tears, and they can be pretty painful. So Patrick, there's some of the key components, if you like, of the uh, hips anatomy. What I think might be quite interesting for, for the listenership of the show, being an active population, is let's maybe talk about common conditions that we'd expect the active population to potentially experience through their life cycle. So you mentioned there, you know, uh, the younger, quite mobile uh, athlete, be it a gymnast or your yoga, end of range sports, potentially upsetting something like the ligamentum teres. Can you also speak about some other conditions and things to signs and symptoms, if you like, that may uh, may give people a bit of an idea on what they may be experiencing, say, sub-25 years of age. Yeah, okay. So uh, probably the, uh, the way we should start um, with answering that question is probably taking it backwards a little bit to looking at the, the lifespan of um, pathologies that we would commonly see within the hip joint. So, um, so if we take it through to, say, for instance, babies and children, um, the, the main pathologies that we would see in the very young um, would be dysplasia. Um, so dysplasia is a shallowness of a socket, which um, uh, is uh, developmental. Um, um, most people who have dysplasia are born with it. Um, there is a, a component that will... Um, that will be developed uh, during the early growth phases of a child. Um, the dysplasia is a condition which is um, uh, tends to run in families, particularly in the girls. It's a little bit more common in the left hip. There are certain um, ethnic groups which are a little more likely to get um, dysplasia of the hip. Um, dysplasia is uh, predominantly thought of as a shallowness of the socket, uh, which means that the, the, the load-bearing area which the hip joint can articulate with is functionally reduced, which means that the, the, each portion of the cartilage is bearing more load, so it wears faster. Um, there are also some changes that we see um, in the thigh bone. So, for instance, there's um, uh, some characteristic um, twist abnormalities that we see in the thigh bone as well, but predominantly it's a it's a disorder of the of the of the socket. Um, so um, we screen all our babies for. Um, so in Australia, we screen all of our babies for 
um, dysplasia and it's one of the the, the, the the neonatal checks that we would do. So if you hear about someone having a clicky hip or a baby having a clicky hip, that's what the test is being used for. Um, and um, so often if we pick it up really early, we can change the natural history of this condition by placing them into splintage. Yeah. So there's a, a particular types of braces that you can use to be able to hold the hip joint in a more secure location, such that the, when the baby de uh, develops their hip and the and the hip joint um, grows, that it will grow into a more structurally regular and congruous joint, uh, reducing the risk of having degenerative joint disease as an adult into the future. So that's that's in the young babies. Then going forward from that, there's a there's a phase where septic arthritis, which is an infection in the joint, is a little more common around the sort of the 18-month age group, give or take. And there's a couple of reasons for that relating to the way in which the blood supply is driven to the hip joint. Um, and then going forward from there, there's a condition um, that starts at around the two or three years of age mark and sort of goes out to about the maybe the 12s, 13s. Um, it's a condition called Perthes disease, um, which is a, a condition where the ball of the hip joint can lose its blood supply um, temporarily, and it causes the, the, the ball to... Um, grow in an out of round shape um, and so that um, will result in um, early degenerative joint disease because the two surfaces are not congruent anymore um, the, the the later children and the adolescents there's a condition called slipped epiphysis um, which is where the shape of the hip joint also changes due to weakness of the growth plate seen predominantly in men and the interesting thing about slipped epiphysis is that we feel that that's the leading cause for the condition known as femoroacetabular impingement so low grade slipped capital epiphysis that was not diagnosed as an adolescent is probably one of the leading causes for the shape irregularity that we see in adults, which leads to early cartilage degeneration in, say, a 20 or a 30-year-old, but they were completely blissfully unaware of it when they were a child. So that's all sort of your childhood and adolescent conditions. No, brilliant. Thanks. Thank you for rewinding the clock there. So there's hip dysplasia, uh, septic arthritis, you know, 18, 18 months. Perthes, yep. Is that 12 to 13 years? 12 to 13 years. Yeah, so starts, Perthes disease starts um, probably a, earliest ones you usually can see about two, three years of age. It's very, very young. The, probably the peak's around about five, um, and it can go out to about 12-ish. And then the slipped capital femoral epiphysis, which, as you say, left um, low-grade ones can then, you know, uh, manifest with the what we know we we'll touch on as the femoroacetabular impingement uh, later in life. So, Patrick, then take us into the adolescent years. Uh, one of the things I know that can happen there is uh, you know potentially developing some of these shape abnormalities with um, with activities. Yeah. So, um, so moving forward from the skeletally immature person to the skeletally mature person, um, which we define as those people who have got fused growth plates um, in whom the shape of the hip joint is now set, um, then we start seeing um, uh, various forms of degenerative joint diseases, um, which uh, can be accelerated by the presence of irregular shaped hip joints. So, um, and so the, 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 the probably one of the more common shape irregularities that we would see in younger adults manifesting with hip joint pain is a condition called femoroacetabular impingement. So femoroacetabular impingement is a condition where the hip range of motion is limited in um, because of a shape irregularity predominantly of the ball of the hip joint, although there can be irregularities of the socket as well that limit the ability for the hip to be able to bend up and twist simultaneously such that there's abnormal striking of the ball against the edge of the socket. And I think if we we go back to um, remembering that the hip joint is cartilage is really 
durable in compression but very poorly resistant to shear um, it's this mechanism that causes shear forces upon the upon the cartilage on the edge of the socket which can very quickly cause degenerative changes in the in in certain so sections of the socket of the hip joint so when we when we diagnose early femoroacetabular impingement if we diagnose that early enough it's a little bit i suppose the 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 analogy that i would give is a a little bit like a, a wheel malalignment in a car where you you take your car down to the mechanic you, 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 the, the mechanic says, listen, the, the edge of the tyre has got a little bit of wear. It's not too bad, but it's starting to wear. But listen, if you look really closely, those wheels aren't straight. And so there are some people in those scenarios in whom we feel that performing some form of mechanical realignment of their joint, for want of a better word, will provide them with some benefit in terms of longevity, slowing the risk of degenerative joint disease. Maybe not eliminating the risk of degenerative joint disease, but certainly slowing its progression. And that mechanical realignment that you reference there, is that just improving in simple terms, as you say, the, the shape of the, uh, the ball and socket? Yeah, so what it is is it's um, the most common one is what we call a cam lesion, which is the the disorder that we that we that we would see most frequently, and that's where the ball of the hip joint has got a a ridge of bone upon the the, the top section, which is um, which is limiting its ability to be able to roll inside the socket, and so it's. It's that shape of normality, for instance, if we were to shave that down, which can be done by keyhole surgery, uh, will provide the patient with a better functional range of motion prior to the hip impinging. So they get a more, more flexible hip joint. Obviously, they can still impinge, anybody can still impinge their hip joint, no matter what their shape, because eventually the hip has got a, a terminal range of motion. But what it does is it places their terminal range into what's more functional pursuits. So during ordinary daily activities or alternatively within their specific sporting pursuit, they're now no longer repetitively hitting their cam lesion up against their socket, causing repetitive damage to the to the cartilage while they're doing so. So it can prolong a, a healthier hip across across the lifespan, the decades to come, potentially. Yeah, so there's a there's a fair bit of controversy in this area, um, and the the reason being is that from a from a a, a scientific um, epidemiologic perspective, to be able to prove such a hypothesis would require us to be able to um, look at patients prospectively for extended durations of time. Um, and um, we'd need reasonably large numbers to do so. And so the, the data that we have to be able to look at, for instance, you know, uh, 30 or 40 years down the track, are you or are you not at risk of degenerative joint disease um, becomes a study which is which is methodologically very difficult for us to be able to construct. Um, so what we what we use is a whole lot of um, um, data which is uh, sort of um, tangential, I suppose, for want of a better word. So it's supportive data, um, but indeed there is still a lot of debate as to um, what our criteria should be. Um, to be able to diagnose the condition. So, um, so what shapes are important shapes and what shapes are important shapes in whom? So does a certain shape confer a risk of developing degenerative joint disease in one person but not another? And then the next question is, um, what surgery and to what extent is necessary to be able to reduce that risk? Yeah, so there are still a lot of questions that are indeed somewhat controversial in this area. You're listening to Associate Professor Patrick Weinrack on this and expert edition on all things hip joint pain and related conditions. Support for today's show comes from Physiocram. Physiocram is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients, ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. 
If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that PhysioCrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates, and its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. PhysioCrem can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist or health store, as well as their online shop. They've even offered a 20% discount off all of their amazing products for listeners of the show. Use the coupon code POGO, P-O-G-O, when you shop at physiocrem.com.au. That's F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M.com.au. Hurting Sucks and Physiocrem have got your back. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following an injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. If you are after an effective physiotherapy solution, no matter where you are in the world, then jump over to pogophysio.com.au, and from there, you can schedule your one-hour initial appointment, including the very popular option for tele health physiotherapy sessions which pogo physio delivers to worldwide patients for now let's jump back with dr patrick Weinrack on this an expert edition on all things hip joint and related conditions i heard in preparing for this patrick a uh, an american uh, colleague of yours, an orthopedic surgeon, cite that on average the young active adult with a non-arthritic osteoarthritic hip but with uh, hip pain will see on average 4.2 uh, practitioners before they're diagnosed with something like uh, femoroacetabular impingement. So that struck me as, uh, as quite a, an interesting statistic. Yeah, so I, I think that the, the, that um, discussion could actually go two ways. Um, in my practice, I, I would, in fact, um, almost see it the opposite way around because um, nowadays with advanced imaging and um, um, with the, our ability to be, particularly be able to do cross-sectional imaging like MRI scans at relatively low cost in this country, um, we, um, we are seeing uh, a lot of people being diagnosed radiologically with this condition. So the awareness of this condition is now high. Um, the, the, the key, though, and this is the same with most areas of medicine, is to be able to correlate the, the, the radiologic findings to, to what you're seeing at the coalface with the patient. And with, and, and, the, and with a sensitive test like an MRI scan, the, 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 the clinical key is to be able to know what is, in fact, clinically important, but the other... But what is also um, maybe not necessary to treat, and so there are a lot of people who are, have, for instance, as an example, um, with femoroacetabular impingement, there are a lot of people with what we call the um, uh, FAI morphology. So FAI morphology is where there's a slight irregularity of the roundness of the ball of the hip joint, which in fact is universal. So the human hip joint in one section is in fact not round. So it's it's universal that everybody's got a section of the ball of the hip joint that's actually out of round. So if, if, you, if you have an MRI scan and you see a portion of the ball of the hip joint that's not round, then it gets labelled as FAI. Right, but that's in fact may in fact be a normal variant, or alternatively, just normal human structure. Right, so so to to we have to make a, a bit of a differentiation between what we call the FAI morphology and what we call the FAI syndrome, which is uh, the FAI syndrome is where you've got a symptomatic hip joint of a patient who's actually got pain. With also with the shape irregularity that would predispose them to developing degenerative joint disease, and what's more so, that they've got stiffness of the hip joint in certain motion planes on physical examination, which correlates with impingement during their sporting activities, for instance. So, yeah, so for me, that's a long-winded way of saying, in my practice, actually, the, the discussion that I have more commonly is trying to... Um, educate people to say, actually, I know your, your, your MRI scan has said that you've got FAI, but in fact, in reality, um, your hip's actually got a, a perfectly functional range of motion um, and you don't necessarily need to have corrective bone surgery done 
you may or may not need to have an operation because you've got a painful cartilage tear, but in that, indeed a bone reshaping procedure, which is a little bit more involved, may not nece- be necessary. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, would this be a, a simple summary? You can have impingement or FAI morphology or shape but not pathology. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So um, so depending on your diagnostic criteria, probably about 30 to 40% of men have got FAI morphology, right? But the vast majority of them will go through their whole lives having no problems with their hips. Right. So, yeah, so it's important to be able to make a differentiation between the two. So FAI as a as a syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. It's made not on the basis of a of an image uh, like an MRI scan. It's made on the basis of the history and the physical examination and and consideration of the of of the functional activity motion patterns that the patient is putting their hip through on a repetitive basis. Patrick, uh, thank you. A another very common, uh, obviously, condition is the osteoarthritic hip. So, uh, can you speak a little bit to what people that may have some symptomatic osteoarthritis might be experiencing, and the things that may alert them that it may be the joint? Yeah. So, the the typical pain that someone would get from degenerative joint disease um, is. Uh, a combination of both pain and stiffness. So the pain is typically groin-based. So it's in the middle portion of the groin. Sort of, um, uh, many people think that their hip joint is actually at the top part where their belt is, um, and that's what we call the iliac crest. Um, the, the hip joint is actually lower than that, so it's uh, it's in the middle part of the groin, and that's where the 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 the, the what I would call the the primary location of hip pain is generally found. Now, when the hip um, develops more advanced degenerative joint disease, you'll then start to get what's called referred patterns. So, referred pain is where the the brain can't work out where the pain is coming from. And so what it will often do is it will distribute pain in a location distant from where the source of the problem is. And so typically it's distal, which means it's down the limb somewhere. Um, So you never really get referred pain up the body. So, for instance, you don't get abdominal pain or back pain from the hip primarily. What you'll get is you'll get pain that will distribute downwards. And the typical one is in the thigh, and in the knee, and so it's in the front of the knee. Um, but then there's other locations that people would get as well. So, for instance, um, when I was in medical school, we used to always be told if you're trying to differentiate between sciatica pain from the back and hip pain, ask the patient whether they get pain below the knee, right? And that will help you differentiate it where sciatica is felt below the knee. But that's not the truth at all. We would we would frequently see people with referred pain from hip from the hip being felt on the side of the shin, for instance. And that's a that's a really common um, distribution of pain. So the the, uh, the the description of someone with hip pain, um, osteoarthritic hip pain, is uh, primarily in the groin with referred pain to the thigh, knee outside of the shin and sometimes the buttock. So it's uh, it's not just the hip localised. Uh, it can be, as you say, referred down, which I think is such important information. And is it a fair correlation that the longer someone leaves the pain and the stiffness or perhaps pushes through it, that the more likely they're to develop this referral? Uh, so it's a measure of the degree of um, cartilage damage in the hip. So... Um, the longer that someone has degenerative joint disease, the more it starts to wear. So, again, going back to the car tyre analogy, it, it's slowly wearing over time. Um, it gets to a certain – many people, in fact, um, are, uh, they can develop quite significant degenerative joint disease without actually having any pain. So that's the other thing to note as well. So there are some people who 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 – who develop quite a lot of wear that's sort of under the radar. Um, and it's not until it gets to a certain threshold where people start to get some symptoms. Um, and so then they come in and they say, listen, doc, I've only had pain for like two months. How can it be that I've got no cartilage in my hip joint? Shouldn't I have felt it before? And in fact, that's actually quite common because they've had non-symptomatic arthritic wear. That that population group in whom radiographically on the X-ray, um, they've had some wear, but it's been going on for 
who knows how long, many, many years, maybe even decades, until it starts to get to the point of, uh, of developing clinical symptoms. Patrick, I've heard you uh, make a distinction between what's often reported or what's read or interpreted on, a, on an image, be it an MRI report, for example, uh, a labral tear, the word tear. And I know you're quite specific with language around this, so uh, can mm. you comfort someone to a degree if there's such a thing uh, in a forum like this that maybe has read that they've got a labral tear and now they're quite panicked? Yeah, so the first thing to say is um, with our modern MRI scans, um, with the with the really high-powered magnets that we've got in the, in the modern scanners, which are pretty ubiquitous now, um, we pick up lots of stuff and labral tears are really, really common. Um, so probably if we put a, 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 um, a bunch of non-symptomatic people through an MRI scanner, we would find some form of degenerative labral change in their MRI scans and probably about 70% of people, right, the vast majority of them being non-symptomatic. Um, now, so the, the other thing to um, – uh, remember about labral tears is that um, so for me I, I don't really like the word labral tear um, I think that that doesn't really reflect the the pathology that we're truly seeing so the the vision that most people have when they talk when they get told about that they've got a tear is that they think that there's two parts that have broken apart um, or ripped and separated. Um, and, in fact, we can see that from time to time, but it, it's, um, it's not all that common. The vast majority of people would have what I would call fraying. And I think that probably refers to the pathology a little bit better because um, what we the best analogy that I'd give for most people's um, labral pathology, um, whether they're symptomatic or not, is more like a rope. And so if you think of a rope with hundreds of fibres all packed in together really, really tightly, um, over time with the sun and the wind and the rain, um, the, the rope just starts to soften a little bit and the core gets a bit softened and little cracks just open up between the fibres and they just start to separate away. Now, when we look with an MRI scan, we can actually see inside that core, right? And so we can see that there's separation of the fibres Fibers. And so we call that the nomenclature that we use to be able to talk with one another as we call it a tear, right? But indeed, in reality, it's more like um, some uh, like accumulative fraying, right? So, um, so in many cases, um, that accumulative fraying, when you look at it at an arthroscopy, it's like just uh, like the surface has got some fraying and you just need to trim like a small section. It's not like two parts have to get sewn back together. I believe sometimes the, the sentiment with uh, someone going off to be consulted by a hip orthopedic surgeon like yourself is that it's all about surgery. Uh, but, you know, you talk about the therapeutic toolbox. It's so much more than uh, surgical procedures can you touch on the therapeutic toolbox, what it is, and then, you know, paint a bit of a picture around some of the more common procedures that you, you may be performing uh, in your practice? Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so most orthopedic surgeons are, um, are pretty conservative. Uh, that's, that's probably not um, uh, widely uh, sort of um, understood. When people come to a, a surgeon, they're sort of expecting that they're going to score an operation. But, uh, in fact, um uh, that's actually, uh, uh, whilst, you know, surgery might be a really good option for you, um, there's, it's like most things in life, there's, there's many, many different ways of being able to achieve an aim, and it really depends on the, on the clinical circumstance. So, that, you know, um, so for instance, when a person comes to see me, I, I don't believe that they're coming to see me to, to, to discuss an operation. They're, they're coming to see me because they've got a hip problem. And so the, 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 the treatment of that hip problem may involve surgery, but in many instances, in fact, it doesn't, um, particularly for people who have got um, uh, earlier spectrum degenerative joint diseases um, or have got conditions that can be very um, adequately or, in many cases, better treated by adequate um, and appropriate guidance and non-operative therapies. Um, and so the, the, um, 
Um, indeed, uh, the, the therapeutic toolbox is a sort of a, uh, a discussion I have with a, a lot of my um, people who come to see me. Um, and it, it, what it is, it's a discussion about uh, the, the, the different options that are available to them in the non-surgical space um, that they can employ skillfully to be able to improve their symptoms um, and to be able to recognise the um the way in which their symptoms are presenting and how their condition changes over time, and then how to use the different strategies that are in their toolbox to be able to treat themselves at any given point in time. Because if you're going to engage in a, a longer-term non-surgical therapy program, you know, that may span many, many years, um, the person has to have a, a really good education and understanding about what they're trying to treat, what options are at disposal, when to use the different options. And often it's a blended approach. So a blending of like um, activity modifications, exercise prescription, um, strength and conditioning exercise, for instance, um, longer acting therapies, for instance, injectable therapies together with with, with shorter acting pharmaceuticals, for instance. And, um, and so to know how to be able to skillfully blend those options together to be able to get a, a good result and then to know when to ask for further assessment and, and to come in for further treatment is, um, is actually forms a really big part of most orthopaedic surgeons practice yeah which i think is absolutely uh fantastic and that's something i you know comfort anyone that is anxious being referred on that hey uh there's so much more to an orthopedic uh surgeon such as yourself than uh than you know surgeries so so that's uh that's wonderful patrick one of the surgeries that i think most people uh recognize and can conceptualize is a total hip replacement but can you speak to the, the hip resurfacing procedure, uh, where it has its place and for whom? Yeah, so um, so hip resurfacing is a, a form of joint replacement. Um, so it is an artificial joint replacement. It's a big deal. Um, the... Um, uh, so a hip resurfacing is a bone-preserving uh, a design uh, which is used as a an alternative to hip replacement in suitable people. So um, so what it is um, essentially is where uh, we would we would preserve the bone of the ball of the hip joint instead of excising the ball of the hip joint and then putting a, um, uh, a rod component into the hollow of the thigh, um, we would keep the ball of the um, hip joint bone intact and just shave the damaged cartilage off and then put a metal cap on top. And then we'd do the same sort of thing in the socket. We'd shave the socket um, and then put a socket liner in that. And it's a, it's a really neat way to be able to treat the hip joint because it's um, because it's really treating the underlying problem because the problem with our osteoarthritis is not the bone in the vast majority. The bone is actually just fine. Right. And this, of course, you have, you know, bone softening conditions or anything. The, the primary problem with osteoarthritis is the cartilage that's worn away. So if we can preserve the bone but treat the cartilage, then um, then that's, a, a, I think, a really um, a succinct way of being able to uh, address the problem directly. Now, um, so hip resurfacing is a, 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 is a um, is an implant which I think does need to be given, like any implant, does need to be given a, a fair degree of respect. Um, it was in fact much common, much more common procedure than what it was, what it is today. Um, so, if we look back at say 2008, um, hip resurfacing in Australia accounted for around about. 10% of the joint, or 2006, 2007, 2008, accounted for about 10% of the joint replacements that we did, primary hip replacements that we did in this country, and it's down to about 1% now. So it's become less popular over time. And the reason why it's become less popular over time is that it has a risk of allergy to the metal in the implant, right? And so it's a cobalt alloy. Right, so cobalt's a really good alloy. Right, it's super durable. Right, so it's amazingly wear resistant. Right, so you just basically you just cannot wear through this implant. It's it's amazingly durable. You can't crack it. You can't chip it. Right, and it's and because it's bone preserving, it's a large bearing diameter. It's much more dislocation resistant. So resurfacing's got a lot of things going for them. The downside is that there is a risk of allergy. Right, and 
the risk of allergy is very dependent on the design of the implant. So it's, it's quite implant to implant specific. So there were some brands of metal hip replacements in particular, but also some resurfacings that had really high, quite severe allergies. And so that's that's caused a, a fairly significant downturn in the use of resurfacing. But in those people in whom meet the criteria for resurfacing, and so the criteria for resurfacing, um, for metal resurfacing that is, so the criteria for metal resurfacing is generally accepted as being a larger framed individual, predominantly male, and in whom preservation of the bone is really important. So that's a young person, right? So younger, higher activity demand, male patients of larger frame, the um, hip resurfacing is a, a fantastic a fantastic implant for those people, and uh, I would, I would, I would do quite a lot of resurfacings in my practice because I see a lot of those people. You're listening to Associate Professor Patrick Weinrack on this and expert edition, focusing on all things hip joint pain and related conditions. If you missed last week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, a featured performer episode featuring Australian Olympic marathoner and dietitian Millie Clark, then here's a little snippet of what you missed. Yeah, I'm all for the salt. I think that's the reason we actually get cramps is not because of magnesium, it's because of uh, low sodium. So anyone, any athlete who's, you know, avoiding salt, I go, but why? (laughs) Just... Put it everywhere. There's the reason that there's those, they invented those, you know, the salt sticks and things like that. It's because, you know, we sweat out predominantly sodium and so we need to replace that and um, I love salt. To enjoy episode 180 featuring Millie Clark, be sure to jump back and enjoy the full episode. Whilst there, peruse the archives, including interest editions, coaches' corners, expert editions and featured performer episodes dating right back to episode one featuring surf life-saving Ironman champion Ali Day. For now, let's jump back on this and expert edition with Dr. Patrick Weinrack on all things hip joint pain and related conditions. And Patrick, uh, post-hip resurfacing procedures uh, and total hip replacements, what's your advice in terms of return to activity? Can people expect to return to high-level activities, running, jumping? What are some of the restrictions? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, the um, So uh, the first thing to understand about joint replacements in modern practice is that our bearings are super, super wear-resistant now. So we're beyond that stage where, uh, for instance, 30 years ago, if we did a joint replacement, we could say to you, predictably, the plastic's going to wear through in 10 years, right? So 10 to 15 years, that's what you got for this thing, right? Because just the rubber's going to wear out of the tire, right? Um, So we're not in that era anymore, right? So we've got now bearings that are so wear resistant that we can hardly detect wear in them, even like, you know, 20 years down the track. So the the modern ceramics, the, the metal bearings, and even the modern plastics now are so wear resistant that we're becoming less and less concerned about the patients now engaging in um, higher volume activity pursuits. So, so, for instance, we, we're not really telling the person that you necessarily need to stop driving the car because the tyres are going to wear out if you drive it too much, right? So that's not really an issue anymore. So the, the so um, bearing wear becomes now much less of an issue in terms of counselling a patient with their activity levels. Um, the issue with running um, is probably relating to the nature of the activity and the impact shock loading that is occurring through the joint. Um, So, um, and that would uh, potentially be a concern because an artificial joint replacement is a, uh, it is a mechanical device, right? And the more you use a mechanical device, and if you abuse a mechanical device and use it in a way that it's not meant to, then potentially could it cause additional wear? And that's certainly a question, you know, a lot of hip replacement designs now are what called modular. And so what we do is when, when we make the when we have the hip replacement, we've got a choice of a whole lot of pieces that we can link together. It's a little bit like putting Lego together. And between each one of those linking pieces, right, there's a junction. And that those junctions are potential port sources of failure with particular, you know, like impact loading and things like that. Um, but 
Uh, I suppose for me, I, I, I take a fairly philosophical point of view on this and that we don't see um, failures in those mechanisms um, very commonly at all. So it is, it is a rare phenomenon. And um, so, for instance, snapping a stem of a hip replacement is almost unheard of nowadays. And so I take a philosophical sort of point of view that we do these procedures for people's quality of life. And unless we've got clear evidence that allowing them to return to the sports that they love um, – is going to cause them harm or detriment, then I'm quite liberal with allowing my people to return to to higher grade physical pursuits, including running sports. And so, and 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 that's a, a common theme amongst many orthopedic surgeons nowadays. And so, a lot of us would allow our our, our patients to return to touch footy and squash and tennis and uh, skiing and you know running. And um, there might be in that consideration, though, there might be some designs of joint replacement that might be a little bit more, uh, I suppose, um, friendly for certain pursuits. For instance, and that would that would that would bear on our decision as to which model of joint replacement we might choose for certain people. Um, and indeed, in this space, it's definitely not a one size fits all scenario. So, for instance, when we're choosing a joint replacement, we would look at, uh, for instance, the patient's age and their activity levels. Um, we'd also look at their bone shape and size, um, but also look at what their anticipated outcome function is going to be too. So uh, a person who engages in, uh, for instance, activities that are involving high degrees of extremes of range of motion like yoga, right, but doesn't do any running might be quite different to your triathlete. Right, and so the, the 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 choice of joint replacement will be tailored according to their anticipated use. So there are choices, there's variations. It's not one size fits all. Absolutely, yeah, no, definitely, and uh, and so whilst most joint replacement systems now will be able to be used in most people, there may be some differences between one joint replacement and another that might be attractive for one patient, one particular patient for. Uh, many given reasons, whether that be underlying, you know, skeletal deformities or activity levels, for instance. Yeah. So that's a hip resurfacing, total hip replacements, and then obviously arthroscopy uh, or people receiving a hip arthroscope. Uh, that may be used in what situations, Patrick? Yeah, so arthroscopy is a, a keyhole minimally invasive uh, joint preserving uh, surgical operation. So, um, so uh, it's where you put a like a, a pencil thickness camera inside the hip joint um, through like five millimeter incision, and through that you can make a, a very very accurate assessment of the hip joint uh, of the degree of cartilage wearing, and then you also get the option of being able to do therapeutic treatments. So so, for instance, if a person's got a, a cartilage tear or a fissure or a crack um, ligament tear or something like that that's causing them pain, you can address that. Um, and so um, hip arthroscopy is generally done in people who have got lower degrees of degenerative joint disease. So they're at the um, earlier spectrum of wear. Um, so they're predominantly younger, more highly active people, right? So your athletes um, often will come with um, cartilage tears that are interfering with their function, then they don't want to give up or reduce their sporting pursuits. So arthroscopy is a good option for them. Arthroscopy is very, very successful, very successful. But um, it's like most operations, it's only successful if you treat the right person. One of the downsides of arthroscopy is that if you've got more advanced degenerative joint disease, so if you've got big sections of cartilage that are missing from the joint, then you can't really adequately reverse that process. You can't turn back the clock. And so in those people, arthroscopy becomes either non-effective or very highly unpredictable. And in so in those cases, we would generally recommend that um, they would steer away from that as a therapeutic option. And is there much evidence base for arthroscopy reducing hip osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease? Yeah, not really. So that's a, that's a pretty hotly debated topic. Um, so one of the things that... Um, uh, a lot of people would come to me 
uh, asking is, I've been diagnosed with this labral tear. I've been getting a little bit of groin pain from time to time. It's not too bad. In fact, now it's settled down completely and it feels okay and I'm back to playing sport and it's all very good. But I've had this MRI scan that says that I've got a labral tear and I'm a bit worried that I'm going to get arthritis into the future. So should I have something done about it? And the answer is no, right? So in someone who's got... Um, uh, like non-symptomatic cartilage damage that's de- demonstrated on a on a um, on a scan. There's no role for doing any intervention for that. We don't have any evidence that would say that your risk of developing degenerative joint disease into the future is made any higher nor lower by doing arthroscopy surgery. So um, even in the symptomatic patient group. Um, it would be a very small subset of people who I'd confidently say to them, doing this operation may make a difference in terms of your risk of arthritis. The vast majority, the discussion is not about theoretical risk of developing wear into the future. It's more about the pragmatic aspect of the fact that they've got a painful joint right now that's interfering with their function, right? So the discussion is more about uh, is more about functional resolution rather than... Um, risk of degenerative joint disease into the future. That's, a, that's a, a great distinction. Patrick, I am itching to ask you these final two questions. You're sitting there with a shirt on that says, comfort is a slow death. And so what is <laughs> Dr. Patrick Weinrau's physical challenge of the week going to be? Okay, so um, my physical challenge for your listeners of the week is to do three workouts this week that focus on a functionally important weakness. So three workouts that fo- this week that focus on a functionally important weakness. So whatever that you think that might be, you want to have three dedicated sessions specifically to that. And so a functional weakness could be defined as what, Patrick? Oh, so for me, it, it's going to be three, three, three good stretching sessions, something that's, uh, that you know I, I don't do enough of, but I really should. Dr. Patrick Weinrau, This is a very difficult question, but if you had to boil everything you've learned across your professional career down to one solitary piece of advice to the listeners of this show to help them perform at their physical best or to maintain a happy, healthy hip as best they can across their lifespan, what would that one piece of advice be? Yep. So I reckon uh, the number one piece of advice that I'd give your listeners is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, so if you're if you're if you're performing well, right, and you're functionally good, if you've got a little cartilage tear in your hip or you've got something going, it doesn't necessarily have to be your hip, but if you've got some sort of musculoskeletal ailment but it's um it's not it's not interfering, then sometimes the better thing is to just watch and observe. Get advice, right, but you don't necessarily have to be railroaded down the road of having treatment or surgery. Oh, that's that's so rich. Uh, I'm often saying something different but similar in that if it's not sore, don't worry about it. Now, it's not to say you can put your head in the sand, but, you know, um, that's terrific advice. Thank you. Uh, if listeners of the show want to find out more about your professional practice, uh, your expertise, where can they find out more, Patrick? Uh, yeah, so our, our clinic's up in Brisbane. Uh, we run the Brisbane Hip Clinic. It's out of Fortitude Valley um, near the city. And um, uh, our website's uh, brisbanehipclinic.com.au. And uh, if, if anyone wants to follow your uh, your wild adventures, uh, anywhere that they can do that? Uh, actually, no. It's, uh, you know, I just put a few bits and pieces. If you're on Facebook, you'll probably see a few bits and pieces come up every once in a while. Yeah. But uh, no, yeah, that's probably the, or, 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 or come on a come on a climb with me <laughs> the, cha- the challenge is out there and uh wonderful stuff dr patrick Vinerau, thank you for your expertise and your generosity in sharing thanks for the uh inv- invitation so there you have it another expert edition of the physical performance show and i trust that you enjoyed today's episode 
And if you did, then please reach out and let myself or Dr. Patrick Vinerack know what it was that you enjoyed. You'll find myself over on social at Brad underscore beer, Instagram and Twitter. Email b.beer at pogophysio.com.au. And if you did enjoy the episode, then feel free to post a podsy. That's a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show. You'll find Dr. Patrick Vinerack's contact details over on the show notes at pogophysio.com.au including links for the Brisbane Hip Clinic if you were seeking Dr. Patrick Vinerack's services. A massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews over on iTunes. A big thanks this week to show listener Marathon Bunny who rated the show five stars and commented, Thank you for keeping me sane during my long runs whilst training for the Gold Coast Marathon with the fascinating guests and technical information. Before I knew it, my run was over and I've been learning so much. Marathon Bunny, thank you for taking the time to leave that review. If you've been enjoying the show and you've listened to, say, four episodes, then please hit subscribe. That really is the best way to, one, get the show into your earbuds each and every week as the episodes go live on a Thursday evening. And two, it is the best way to help the show grow and reach more people who, just like yourself, are looking to enjoy pursuing their own physical best. A big thanks to the three very good folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, Matthew Walden on all things graphic design, and Oliver Crossley behind the scenes. Another huge thank you to today's show sponsor, Physiocrem, for their support. Podcasts are free to download. However, they are not free to produce. So thank you, Physiocrem. Don't forget, Physiocrem's generous offer, 20% off all Physiocrem products over at their store, Physiocrem, F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M dot com dot A-U. Simply use the code P-O-G-O for 20% off all the Physiocram range. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we keep the expert edition theme going and I'll share with you a conversation on all things shoulders, more specifically wobbly shoulders, unstable shoulders with leading sports physiotherapist, Mr. Adam Meekins from the UK. If you have ever struggled with your shoulders, perhaps you know someone who has dislocated a shoulder, subluxed a shoulder, or had ongoing shoulder concerns, then this is an episode, an expert edition you are not going to want to miss. Adam Meekins has a gift of taking the complex and making it digestible and fun. And here's a little snippet of my conversation with Adam Meekins. Well, I think some of the mistakes I see, problems I see, I think with therapists when it comes to you know, managing of the unstable shoulders, they have to wrap it up in cotton wool. You know, I, I do see a lot of fear of about, you know, exposing a shoulder back into some robust rehab. Again, a lot of therapists tend to believe that they only can work on the rotator cuff and therefore they give these sort of rotator cuff related exercises to try and help the shoulder, which you do have to do, but they're not the only things you need to be doing. Following Adam Meekins, we will return to a featured performer episode before we launch into a month long running fiesta, including including a back-to-back expert edition series on all things bone stress injuries and their management. Until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.